All right, so let's go on to section two. And we're going to relate the idea of coset to partition. Now, in example 10.1.1, when we talked about modular arithmetic, the cosets that we described were equivalence classes. And we saw that equivalence classes form a partition. In fact, cosets always form a partition of the group that they're in. So I can say that the, let's just write it this way, if you have a group H, which is a subgroup of G, then the cosets of H cosets of H form a partition. They form a partition of G. And that's what we're going to prove in this section. Now, we could have gone a different way. We could have defined an equivalence relation and showed that the equivalence relation gives equivalence classes which are cosets and those cosets would then automatically form a partition. But what we're going to do is go this way and say that we're going to prove that cosets form a partition and that gives us that cosets define equi an equivalence relation. All right. So what we're going to do is prove some properties of the idea of coset. So here we have H is a subgroup of a group big G and G1 and G2 are in big G and the following conditions are equivalent. This first condition says that the coset created from the subgroup H and the element G1 is equal to the coset created from the subgroup H and the element G2. So supposing this condition is true, then condition true 2 is also true, that G1 inverse G2 is in H. So what this theorem is saying is that, in fact, these two conditions are equivalent. Whenever 1 is true, 2 is also true, and vice versa. 3 is another equivalent condition. If G2 is in the coset defined by G1, then, in fact, the coset created from G2 is the same as the coset created from G1. And furthermore, G1 inverse G2 is in the subgroup H. Now, condition 4 says that we don't even need equality as long as we know that one subgroup is contained in the other subgroup. I'm sorry, there's one coset is contained in the other coset. We can automatically conclude that the two cosets are equal, and that one element is in the, other, uh, the coset of the other element etc. And then here we have a relation between left cosets and right cosets. That if the two left cosets corresponding to two different elements are the same, then the two right cosets corresponding to the inverses of those elements are also the same. So these are all facts that are equivalent and the proof is left up to you. There's a number of hints in the back of the book to help you with the, these parts. But here I'm just trying to give an outline of the argument. Okay. So, from this, we're going to prove this proposition. Let H be a subgroup of a group G, then the left cosets of G in H partition G. That is, the group G is the disjoint union of the left cosets of H and G. So, the picture here, and I think there may be a picture later, but I'll draw it here also. Here's my group big G. And here's my subgroup H. And of course, the identity is in H here. So I'll draw the identity. Now, what this is saying is that the, par the, the cosets partition G. So I can create cosets here. And each one of these sets here, each one of these slices is a coset. So this is, whoops, sorry. This, is, this would be, say, G1H. This would be G2H. This would be G3H and G4H. Now it turns out that G1 is in G1H, G2 is in G2H, which should be clear because G1H includes G1 times the identity. But here we have this picture of G being divided up into layers or slices, just like a layer cake. All right. Now here's the proof. 
the proof really has two parts. We need to show that di different cosets are disjoint, or if they're not disjoint, they're identical. And then we also need to show that the cosets uh, union forms the entire group. So different cosets are disjoint, and the union of cosets is the entire group. So different cosets are as disjoint follows as follows. Suppose that I do have a non-zero intersection between two cosets, then I'll have some element that's in both cosets. And by the definition of left coset, A would be equal to G1H1 and would also be equal to G2H2 for some elements H1 and H2. That's what it means for A to be in G1H, that there is a H1 such that A equals G1H1. All right. But from that, we can rearrange, we can multiply on the uh, right by H1 inverse, both sides of this equation, and get G1 equals G2 times H2 H1 inverse, which means that G1 is in G2H. If G1 is in G2H, then we get from proposition 10 to 1, uh, G1 is in G2H was condition 3, so from condition 3, we can conclude condition 1, which says that the two cosets are, in fact, identical. All right? So this tells us that the that cosets are dis, different cosets are disjoint. And then here we're going to show that the union of cosets is all of G. So that forms a partition. So, we, so this completes the proof that the left cosets form a partition. The right cosets also form a partition, may not be the same partition because right cosets may not be the same as left cosets. All right. Now let's consider how many cosets there are for a particular subgroup. Okay. So let me make some convenient notation. We'll define the index of a subgroup H in a big group G is the number of left cosets of the group subgroup H in big G. And we'll denote the index by G colon H. So the big group comes first, then the colon, then the small group. So you can think of this kind of as like G divided by H. It's something like that. It's how many times H goes into G. And we have some examples. In this case, we had Z6, which has six elements, and 0, 3. And uh, it turns out that, uh, that this gave us three cosets. Okay, so you can go back and see how many cosets you got from different things. Now, it turns out that the number of left cosets is always equal to the number of right cosets. And you can read this proof. Basically, we can create a bijection between left cosets and right cosets. And if you have a bijection that's one to one and on to between two different sets, those two different sets must have the same number of elements. Okay. All right, so let's go on. And we'll stop there and uh, go on in the next video.